Um, good afternoon and good morning. Uh, this is uh, Martha Calfee with Metheny Stees and Associates. I'm also the Tennessee HFMA Chapter President for 2015-16. So welcome to our, our uh, webinar for today and thank you for those who could uh, um, switch the dates with us um, due to speaker illness and we certainly understand that. Um, the, we've posted the slides today in the um, Go to webinar uh, chat box. There is a link there. There's also in, a, in the handout section. You can reach them um, at that at that location. Um, a few announcements today before we get started. Uh, the next webinar that we will have will be January the 12th. Uh, visit our TennesseeHFMA.org webinars for more information on that. Uh, our next major Tennessee HFMA meeting. Uh, will be the uh, Tri-State Institute in Memphis this year. Uh, we're moving it from Tunica to Memphis at the request of many of the attendees. So visit tristateinstitute.org for more information and to register. Uh, registration is open and the hotel block um, will be closing in early January for that one. Uh, registration is also open for our Dixie Institute Tennessee is hosting um, the Region 5 uh, Dixie Institute this year uh, in Nashville in March. It's March the 20th through the 23rd. Uh, Region 5 consists of the Alabama, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and Tennessee chapters. So please visit hfmadixie.org and look out, um, check out all the information for that um, presentation. Um, the CPE requirements for today's um, webinar, you must be connected at least 90% of the time and you must respond to at least two-thirds of the polling questions. Um, today's presentation, Physician Practice Acquisition Analysis and Valuation, is being presented by Bob DeLuca. He has over 25 years of experience exclusively in healthcare industry and is the leading leader of IMA's consulting uh, regulatory consulting practice. Bob has extensive experience in Medicare regulatory matters, including both prospective and cost-based payment systems. Uh, he has provided expert witness testimony at PRRB hearings, represented numerous provider clients and appeals at both the Medicare uh, uh, MAC and the CMS regional and national levels. Um, he has assisted many providers and their legal counsel in responding to various OIG and DOJ investigations. Bob earned his Bachelor of Science in Accounting from St. Joseph University. He is a CPA in Pennsylvania. Uh, he is affiliated with the AICPA, the Pennsylvania Institute of CPAs, and the American Health Lawyers Association. He was also past president for 2002 and 3 of the Metropolitan Philadelphia HFMA chapter. And with that, Bob, thank you for uh, presenting today, and I will turn the session to you. Thanks, Martha, and thanks for uh, a really gracious introduction. I really appreciate that. I want to thank you and thank Pam Jones, and, and also apologize to everyone who was inconvenienced last week when I was sick. Um, I had tried really hard to be able to talk on Tuesday and it just wasn't to be and I think a lot of people are feeling that same way so I apologize for um, for any inconvenience I, I, I caused anyone. Um, today's presentation is Physician Practice Acquisition Analysis and Valuation and if I turn on to page two of, of the uh, PowerPoint slides just there's four objectives I would like to accomplish today. The first is, you know, understanding what some of the underlying reasons are why some hospital systems and physicians are moving in this direction in the industry right now. I'd also like to review the acquisition due diligence process, spend some time talking about the various physician practice valuation methodologies, and then looking beyond the transaction and looking at some of the post-acquisition integration issues. There's quite a bit of challenges that I'll go over. There are some success stories and um, we'll spend some time going through those. But let me, um, let me start in on what are the underlying reasons really from, from a physician's perspective. And first and foremost, and as everyone realizes, there's a lot of uncertainty with regard to healthcare reform. 
there's confusion and concern over things like value-based purchasing, bundled payment methodologies, and general payer contracting complexity. They're all motivations for physicians to consider an employment model. Also, measuring and reporting on quality and efficiency metrics, they pose additional burdens on an already stressed business operation that physicians um, endeavor on. There's also administrative burden of running a practice. Just the authorization, reauthorization process is really burdensome and time consuming. And oftentimes physicians themselves have to argue on behalf of their patients with insurance companies on coverages of procedures, some prescription drugs, even forms of, of some forms of dosage of drugs, whether they can be dispensed and covered in pill form or powder form. Um, there always seems to be a back and forth debate between the physician and the insurance company getting coverage. The, the, the denials and appeals process often requires direct time by the physicians also. They're constantly being second guessed by medical directors from a lot of the insurance companies. And the expense and difficulty of implementing electronic health record systems is also a, a barrier and a challenge that physicians look at with some, uh, with some concern. Access to capital is, is another issue. You know, are they able to hire physician extenders um, to give them adequate coverage? The availability of lines of credit, you know, how often does the Medicare program itself decide to simply freeze payments to physicians? And what do physicians do when those things take place? Do they have available lines of credit? And are they able to improve and enhance their physical office? You know, um, a lot of offices are moving in a consumer-driven environment to nicer space, trying to develop web-based applications, patient portals, you know, for test result, uh, you know, availability. Yeah, things are all moving in that direction and it puts another strain on a physician trying to keep his practice current and up to date. Work-life balance is a huge issue, um, especially primary care physicians. Um, you know, they want to have some assistance with coverage options after hours and on weekends or even when their patients are in hospitals as inpatients. Um, it requires more of their time to visit the patients in that, in that environment. There's been an overall shift to a market model. Younger doctors are more inclined than their predecessors to work for a hospital and secure a set schedule and predictable compensation. The creation of ACOs and, and SINs, clinical integration networks by the Affordable Care Act has also promoted more of an employment model. There's a physician search firm that does a lot of work in this space called Merritt Hawkins. And Merritt Hawkins actually testified before Congress in, I think it was in 2014, that only 2% of its searches in 2012 were for docs to either start or join a solo practice compared to 42% in, uh, in 2004. They also indicated that 63% of its current searches were conducted for hospitals. And there were just 11% of those searches conducted for hospitals a short while before that. So you can see that the, the, the market is moving to this model at this point. And there are some of the reasons why physicians are in that, in that area. What are some of the underlying reasons for hospitals, really, if you think about from a hospital's perspective? You know, they want to lock up covered lives in these new ACO type models. You know, as health systems consider how operations will likely change, you know, migration from a cost of inpatient setting to a same day or ambulatory setting, they seek to have more physicians participate in their clinically integrated networks. Also, if you look at current research, um, some conducted by the Congressional Research Service, 84% of Americans entered a healthcare system through their physician's primary care office. So with that knowledge, hospitals who want to be responsible for more and more lives in a population health environment want to make sure that they are in the, in the forefront of that and they would like to make sure those patients enter their ACO. A lot of hospital systems are establishing centers of excellence. You know, it's a consumer-driven market competing for patients. Lots of health systems have developed centers of excellence in areas such as women's health, cancer care, orthopedics, and cardiology. 
And when they do that, they want to you know, seek and recruit well-known specialty physicians to enable that strategy. They want to try and gain leverage also for payer contracting and bundling purposes. Hospitals, many of them, are pursuing high-risk contracts for certain specialty services, which include both the hospital and physician professional fee components for the third-party payment. An employment model with a physician enables a more efficient mechanism within which to adequately manage the totality of payment under a bundled payment methodology. And also, lots of systems are playing defense against competitors or even insurers. They're trying to shore up the fringe portion of their patient catchment area. Some competing in certain markets where insurers have been active in the physician acquisition space. Um, if you think of um, areas like Western Pennsylvania, um, Highmark is very, very active in competing with the health systems in that market. Also in New York City, um, it's, a, it's another highly competitive market where payers are very, very engaged in the physician provider space. And docs are approaching hospitals defensively saying that a competing hospital has made an offer to them and you know, they, they, they aren't sure where their, their existing hospital stands in that, in that situation. What are some of the trends in the marketplace? Again, what are some of the underlying reasons why these acquisitions are taking place? Well, healthcare M&A reached over $240 billion in, as of May of 2015 in the last year. It's the highest volume ever recorded in a 12-month period. Um, there's economies of scale. Um, it makes sense at a high level, you know, but careful planning and execution is required to achieve the benefits. I'll discuss more of the economies of scale as we get in, into the post-acquisition integration discussion later in my presentation. There's a shift from value to volume, from, from, from volume to value. Um, hospitals are realizing they can no longer afford to be everything to everyone and must select those areas they want to excel in, invest in those areas to then acquire the resources, i.e. physicians, to deliver that service in a more efficient manner and with a higher level of quality and patient safety than their competitors. There's enhanced consumer appeal. You know, end user patients are more, much more engaged in choosing their providers, reviewing quality scores, and considering costs as a driver in, in their individual healthcare decisions. When hospitals and physicians combine their efforts through an acquisition model, it enables enhanced office sites and locations through added geographic service area usually involves more flexible office hours with typically improved e-health capabilities, patient portals, you know, to receive lab and radiology results in at a faster pace. Now there's a shift right now from what I call horizontal to vertical M&A. Horizontal really is, you know, similar entities purchasing one another. Think back a few years ago, particularly in the mid-90s, when hospitals were buying hospitals to expand their own footprint. The strategy wasn't um, generally successful, but that is an example of what's known as horizontal M&A. It's moved more to a vertical M&A right now where hospitals are acquiring different provider segments, payers, non-acute providers like physician practices, retail clinics, home health agencies. According to an Accenture analysis, the four-year trend from horizontal to vertical M&A vertical from 2010 to 2014 has shifted by over 10 percent, which is very significant. Now, it's a little off topic, but just know the digital and e-health space is really expanding as well. There's a ton of venture money and federal funding available right now for digital and e-health technology. There's many startups focused on telemedicine and population health management. So, you know, that's a, that's a big area right now that is, um, is, is underway as well. Um, this slide, there's, there's not a lot um, on page six, marketplace trends. You can see some shift from 13 to 14. I wasn't happy that this didn't come out too clearly, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Um, Bob, do you want to do the first the polling question? Oh, yeah, I did skip over that. I'm so sorry, Martha. Yes, there's polling question number one. Okay. 
Okay. No, you um, want me to do it or no, you to go? I've got it. The okay. question is, what are the underlying reasons why physicians are interested in having their practices acquired? Um, gaining, negotiating, leveraging, le gaining, uh, negotiating leverage with managed care insurers, seeking a better work-life balance, enable receipt of payment under the bundle payment system, responses one and two, or all of the above. And um, please answer one of the questions if you need CPE. It doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. We just ask for a response. <clears throat> And we'll leave this open for just a uh, about a minute. So if you've got time, if you've not voted, then please pick one of the answers. Okay, I'll close this poll and. Um, share the response. Most people picked um, all of the above. 40% uh, said uh, gaining negotiating leverage or seeking work-life balance. So I guess, uh, Bob, you can tell us the correct response. Yeah, it's a little bit of a, a curveball of a question, but response number three really isn't um, correct in that you know, you don't have to be in an employment model to receive a bundled payment. It makes it easier. And, you know, so I, I thought that response number three really was not included in all of the above. I just said uh, it was just responses number one and two. Very good. You can continue on. Okay. I'm on slide seven. Again, under the underlying reasons, some of the legal, legal considerations. And there's three issues there. Um, first is the Stark Law. Um, typically, in, in, in any of these transactions, either internal or ex external counsel will consider any Stark issues. And just you know, to review, Stark is a, a federal physician self-referral law. It prohibits physician referrals for certain designated health services if the doc has a financial relationship with the entity he or she is referring to. If you recall, years ago, a physician owned a part of an imaging center or had a stake in a lab um, diagnostic laboratory um, center, they couldn't really refer tests, you know, patients for tests into those entities. Um, there's the anti-kickback statute, which is also a federal law, but it prohibits the exchange of any remuneration with the intent to reduce referrals. Fair market value is the key defense component to this statute especially in physician practice acquisition transactions. It's fairly standard practice that hospitals pay nothing in excess of fair market value determined via an independent evaluation of the practice so as to eliminate any inference that expected referrals were part of the purchase price. And then just tax considerations. There is always a review done to ensure that nothing in the transaction might potentially expose or jeopardize the hospital's tax exempt status you know, you want to keep everything on a fair market value basis to avoid any inference of any private enormous or private benefit. You know, things like greatly reduced rent, God forbid free rent, you know, greatly reduced billing services or administrative assistance is, is issues along that regard. So just, you know, bear those, those concerns in mind. And just some other drivers. Um, Office-based procedures, you know, specialty practice reimbursement reductions. You know, office-based procedural reimbursements have been gutted in the specialty markets over the past few years in both payment rate reductions and increased scrutiny by payers that have medical necessity of such procedures. And there's been a ton of coverage denials in this space. You know, the rise of the, the retail marketplace. You know, the minute clinics are, are you know, they're, they're at CVS and Walgreens. There's tons of urgent care centers that have opened up. Um, consider, you know, couple this with the typical uber busy lifestyles of the millennials. You know, I, I have a 25 year old that still doesn't have a primary care physician. He'll just run to CVS or to Walgreens to just stop in when it's convenient to him. And, you know, there's increased pressure on traditional physician practices to deal with this, this type of, of, of patient and have more flexible office hours. There's also pressures on specialty practice margins. 
um, there's, there's been vast improvement on non-invasive treatment option, options, specifically reduce, you know, pro forma projections of necessary surgical procedures. Just think 10 years how the stents, use of stents has revolutionized the cardiac surgery business. You know, think of some of the, the pro forma projections that were done years ago, thinking how many cardiac procedures would come into the hospital, and that's really, really changed things. And overall, there's been a huge migration of services from inpatient to outpatient. And, you know, outpatient payments are greatly reduced in terms of comps to inpatient payments to hospitals and physicians. So here's some of the other drivers. Um, what are some of the, on, on slide 9, the underlying reasons, you know, what are the typical phases for a practice acquisition? Well, one, there's the transaction itself. There's typically a discovery process to determine if there's mutual interest. You know, who approaches who and why does the acquisition fit, fit either side strategy? Um, you know, is it, is, it, is it something in the interest of the hospital or are they being, you know, reactionary? Um, some, of these transactions, some of these transactions can take several years. They can entail multiple options and scenarios. There's lots and lots of back and forth. And I got to tell you, having been involved in many of these from the hospital's point of view, um, being an advisor to many hospitals going down this road, it's a transaction of greatly mismatched resources. You know, the hospital typically has um, an arsenal. Um, there's many executives and staff engaged in the process. They'll have outside consultants advising them, outside counsel or, in, or internal counsel, and valuation experts working on their behalf. The practice usually has the physician himself and maybe his attorney who does lots and lots of other things besides just healthcare. So it's a, it's a very, very one-sided transaction um, typically. Day one integration is a, is a big part of the actual acquisition process. There's challenges on so many fronts. There's, you know, the day-to-day -day management's going to change. There's a learning curve on data systems, how to order ancillary tests, how to bill, code, how to requisition supplies. There's, there's, a lot, there's lots and lots of things that the physicians have to come to grips with after the transaction takes place. And is there a long-term plan? You know, the ability of the integrated practice to create value for both the acquiring hospital and for the physician themselves. You know, that has to be thought through. Um, okay, um, before I move to a new section on acquisition due diligence, there is a second polling question, Martha. So, take it away. Okay. <clears throat> this question is, why are hospitals and health systems seeking to acquire physician practices to comply with federal tax guidelines, to tie physician incentive payment to referral streams, to expand e-health capabilities to achieve a greater level of clinical integration or all of the above. Again, the, the requirements for the CPE requirements is to answer at least two-thirds of the polling question. So even if you don't know the right answer, then please just select one of the answers. Okay, we've got about 75% voted. Just click real quick if you're going to vote. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the majority of the folks, 56% uh, said achieve a greater level of clinical integration, and 38% said all of the above. So, Bob, you can give us the correct response. Yeah, the, um, the answer is um, response four, just to achieve a greater level of clinical integration. Um, the key is question one, um, you know, it's not necessary to come together to just comply with tax guidelines. You can, you know, work separately and still be in compliance with federal and state tax guidelines. So um, all of the above was, was not the right answer, it was response number four. Okay. 
Very good. Okay. I'm going to move over to slide number 11 um, and begin talking about the acquisition due diligence process, which is, you know, after a, an understanding has been reached between the hospital and the practice that, you know, they want to get more serious and, and you know, understand what, what underlying issues might be in the business that they may be buying. Um, there's an acquisition due diligence process. Sometimes it's done by outside consultants, sometimes it's done by hospital individuals and, um, and individuals that work for the physician's practice. But first and foremost, you know, is there a defined strategy? Is it a haphazard strategy? Um, is it reactive? Are you just reacting to someone who is, you know, has approached you? Or I always say, God forbid, is it the monkey see, monkey do approach? Um, you know, my competitors are buying practices. I better get myself in the game too. Um, you know, that that is a question that should be asked early in the process. Does the target practice that the hospital is considering meet the strategic goals and objectives it has? You know, has the health system defined a center of excellence in any of those areas I spoke of? You know, ortho, cancer care, women's health. You know, maybe cardiology. Does this acquisition fit one of those centers of excellence? You know, primary care might be the this true strategy. You know, these issues should be discussed at the highest levels of the health system to ensure that the acquisition objectives and tactics are consistent with the strategy. The method of acquisition should be discussed. You know, senior leadership needs to weigh in. Um, internal counsel should be consulted, you know, legal ramifications, structures, liabilities, if they are, are, are not going to be assumed. You know, years ago, leasing practices gained momentum, but that general interest has diminished considerably in recent years, especially by physicians. And lastly, you know, you need to define the transaction. What assets are in the deal, not in the deal? What practitioners, you know, it might be one physician may want to be interested in being acquired, the other may not be. Um, and what about the administrative staff? Are, are they all um, deal breakers in terms of, of the physician insisting that they all be hired by the hospital and those positions can't be eliminated? They are, they're all things that need to be discussed and determined up front so there are no surprises down the road. Okay. Slide 12. You know, Kicking the tires, you know, finding out what you're really buying. You know, what are some of the things that you'll do? You know, you'll certainly do an organizational review, a legal review. Look at org charts, you know, who is in the practice. Um, what are some of the affiliation agreements that that practice has? Are they with some of your competitors and how are you going to you know, work through that? What's the location of all of the offices and maybe satellites that um, they provide care in? you know, during the, during the five-day week or six-day week that they, they run a practice. Some of the contracts, you know, what do the payer contracts look like? What are some of the real estate leases? You know, how long are they in duration for? Do there, are there any loans outstanding, notes, guarantees? You know, all these things have to be known up front. Um, you know, information about the medical staff and other clinicians. You know, what is the age, background, medical directorships that some of these individuals have. Are they very, very close to retirement? And therefore, what are you really buying? What are the weekly hours that they dedicate to the office? What do they dedicate to visiting their patients in the hospital or in nursing homes? And what major services or procedures do they perform and provide? You know, where is basically their revenue coming from? What is it based in? And typically, there's there's you know a significant financial analysis that's done. Typically, you know practice operating income is reviewed for the past two or three years. Cash flows are looked at for the past three years, and you always want to identify any trends in volumes, revenues, or expenses that you might want to look into further. Whether there's reductions, increases, you know large deltas that you want to get your arms around and find out why. Um, just some other issues on page 13. Um, what's the physical office look like? Um, you know, you need to obtain info on the physical office, whether it's owned or leased, depreciation and debt service, you know, what those levels are, what the monthly rental might be, and what's the total square footage of the facility that the physician operates in? How are the rooms laid out, the treatment rooms? Um, 
want to take an inventory of movable equipment, you know, furniture and other assets. You also want to determine if the environment is conducive to enable a technology upgrade. You know, do they have T1 lines? Do they have internet con connectivity? You know, in some cities, uh, you know, I, I, I live in Philadelphia, there's a lot of older, older buildings that physicians operate out of that have plaster walls or concrete walls. It makes Wi-Fi connectivity a real challenge and it has to be considered and overcome as you retrofit space like that. Um, there should be a regulatory review performed. You want to know, did the physician's practice ever have a federal or state level inquiry? You know, was the OIG ever looking at claims or was the state Medicaid Bureau of Program Integrity um, looking at claims? Were there any Department of Health licensure issues? You know, you want to make sure you're, you, you're fully aware of what you're buying. You want to look at insurance issues, um, you know, property casualty, workers' comp, cyber insurance, if, if, if they have such a policy. What's their professional liability and what's their claims review history? You know, want to make sure of these things. Information systems are a huge issue. You know, what software do they run the practice on? You know, for management, practice management, for billing. Um, what outsourced relationships might they have? You know, they have any long-term contracts with outsourced billing companies? Are there any early outs that, that would enable you to get away from a contract like that if you look to consolidate billing down the road? And most importantly, you know, electronic health records. You know, what type of system, if any, have they implemented? How far down the road are they? Um, page 14, um, some of the other issues that, that certain hospitals are, are just, um, you know, careful about is, you know, looking at compliance and, and perhaps doing a billing coding review. Um, many systems do that type of review if they're going to perform one under attorney-client privilege. And, you know, conducting the review under privilege, you know, either through internal or external counsel, it does provide a layer and you know another level of protection if you do come across any adverse findings. There's lots of sample selection strategies. You don't want to spend a million dollars to do this review. You want to do it in a really smart, economical way. So you want to you know cover as many you know docs and locations as the coding process might vary by by site by practitioner. So you want to make sure most of the physicians are in your sample size. And you want to try and use an 80-20 approach to gain economies of scale. You know, select a reasonable size to get ample coverage, to get adequate coverage at a reasonable cost, especially if you're going to do this with an outside um, firm to come in and do this for you. You want to spend your dollars, you know, these acquisition due diligence dollars wisely. You also want to identify volumes, visits, procedures, you know, get comparative data for the last two or three years for the practice and compile a financial performance grid. You can identify trends, determine how practice metrics compare to industry benchmarks, you know, look at some, some comparative data from MGMA and see how this practice kind of measured up, measures up. Okay, page 15. Um, you know, there are some projections that are, that are done typically as hospitals consider purchasing practices. And, you know, what I term a black box revenue projection is done fairly frequently. And, you know, first and foremost, you know, you do one of these because you go into these assuming that the payer rates that the hospital has already negotiated will prevail and they'll apply to the acquired practice's volume. You know, if they have a contract with the payer, they feel that they can roll this new volume into that contract and get paid at these higher rates. So, you know, these different entities can't share contracts. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's illegal. It's, there's lots of reasons why you don't want to do it. So usually an independent third-party consultant is engaged to, you know, prevent the sharing of the actual payment rates between the acquirer and the practice being acquired. And the combined net revenue projection can be shared without revealing the actual ind individual payment rates. So that's really what the what considered to be the black box. There also might be value to modeling, you know, site of service impacts. Um, you know, an analysis might be performed to determine if potential third-party insurer fee schedule impacts exist 
due to a site of, a site of service differential between a hospital-based service and that same service being performed in a physician's office. For example, um, you know, we've personally come across this in different regions in the country, um, not for federal programs, but for individual managed care payers and commercial payers, where there's different fee schedule levels, and particularly for certain specialties um, like cancer care, some of the chemo drugs, um, they're, they're coded at CPT, like a, they're J-code CPT codes. There can be sometimes a significant differential between providing a chemo infusion service in a hospital um, department versus a physician's private office. And, you know, there can be certain windfalls that, that can be modeled and, and um, identified in some of these. So that's, that's sometimes an area certainly worthwhile looking at. And I just caution everyone, I, you know, we've done a lot of these analyses and at the end of the day, you know, the transferability of the rates, it becomes always an issue. You know, you can perform all these analyses that you want and you can identify windfalls, but there's no certainty that a payer, you know, a payer is just going to simply roll over and grant these higher rates without a fight. Uh, many times a, a renegotiation of the post-acquisition payment rates is required. So. Um, I just caution everyone to be careful and, and don't count on this revenue just yet in the beginning of the process. Um, many times also there is a revenue cycle assessment done. You know, it's not a, it's not a significant full-blown revenue cycle which could be really time consuming. But really, you know, if you're, certainly if you're looking, if, if AR becomes part of the transaction, the hospital certainly wants to test its net realizable value you know, perform a bulk proof test to contractual allowances, you know, see when contractuals are taken at, at time of billing, time of payment, um, just so you know that you're, with the numbers you're looking at are gross or, or are they net. You know, get an idea of what the AR days are and the days cash on hand. You know, how do those days in AR compare to the industry benchmarks that you typically see? And how thin does the practice run on cash? You know, is there a line of credit available how often is that line hit? It'll give you a sense of, of how, how you know, clean the, the, the billing cycle is, how quickly they're collecting cash. You always want to look at you know, bad debt write-offs. Look for problematic trends, deductible copay collections, and timeliness of billing and payer-specific trends. You know, in recent years, with the increase in the usage of high deductible plans, collections from patients are at an all-time high. Um, Patients are the most difficult class of payer to collect from and much harder than insurance companies. So just be careful. Um, move on. What are some of the elements of a purchase price? You know, um, working capital of the practice. Many practice acquisitions don't include cash, AR, or working capital that I've had experience in. Um, the bigger issue is how much working capital will you, as the acquirer, be kicking in to enable the practice to operate more efficiently or to live up to some of the promises you may have made to the doc in terms of work-life balance, you know, more coverage to consummate the transaction. Make sure there's a clear line between pre and post liabilities. You know, usually you know, there's a day one date identified and anything pre-day one belongs to the physician, anything day one or post belongs to the hospital. Consider malpractice claims. Um, I've seen hospitals, you know, buy tail coverage just to to cover those, you know, un, unknown claims that may come come due after day after the day one date. And physician compensation. Um, just think about paying for production. There's lots of time signing bonuses. There's still bonuses tied to RBU levels and MGMA benchmarks by specialty and geographic region are often considered when setting um, the compensation levels. So, um, okay, I'm going to move on to the actual practice valuation methodologies if there are no questions. Okay. Um, on page 19, on slide 19, there is a standard of value, you know, Healthcare regs stipulate fair market value is the standard of value, and I know everyone's heard this a million times, but it's the price at which you know property changes hands between a willing buyer and a willing seller, not acting out of duress, not being forced into this by any other reason. 
Um, there's regulatory requirements, you know, don't pay more than fair market value or you expose yourself to potentially paying for referrals and you could violate the federal anti-kickback statute. There's three common approaches. I'll get into each one of those in more detail in the following slides. Just know that there's IRS guidance out there, particularly Revenue Ruling 5960. It provides guidance on the valuation of physician practices. Basically concludes that the income and market approaches are most appropriate and that the cost approach isn't very appropriate for valuing physician practices. The reasoning is that their value is driven by an economic benefit stream, not really by assets, not by hard assets. So you'll hear me say terms like EBITDA, and I'm sure everyone's heard of that term before or variations thereof. It's earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. The income approach, um, you know, the income approach is the present value of future economic benefits. There's two different individual methodologies within it. Um, there's direct capitalization methodology and discount kind of cash flow methodology. Um, you know, the income approach basically is applicable when future economic benefits are derived from sales of a product or provision of a service. It's based on the provision the present value of a future economic benefit. And let me go over to direct capitalization methodology first and tell you what some of the differences are. It's historical results. And whenever you hear historical results, it's some derivative of income, whether it's income, it's normalized income, it's debt-free cash flow, some type of earnings, you know, they are typically normalized. You know, one-time items are removed. And you use this direct capitalization methodology when future trends are stable, when you don't see huge variations coming at you down the pike, direct capitalization is the way to go. It's mostly applicable for mature industries when company-specific ramp-up period is over and when the industry itself is stable. Like you would not have used this method for dot-coms back in the 90s. The values derived from taking normalized results, again, some type of earnings adjusted and applying a long-term growth rate, a discount rate, and a corporate tax rate. It's, it, it seems much more complex than it is, but that's, that's basically it. Um, on slide 21, the discounted cash flow method, you know, the results are normalized just like the, the capitalized, <clears throat> the direct capitalization methodology. But under the income approach for the discounted cash flow method, the expected variables, the expected future um, results can be variable. Okay? This is the most commonly used methodology under the income approach, especially for, for physician practices. It addresses variations in revenue growth, potential changes in either service or payer mix, as well as entity specific changes in terms of depreciation or debt. Or, or different things it may do. This method measures the value of expected cash flows over a period of time. It takes the present value of the future cash flows of the physician practice based on historical performance, industry benchmarks, and expected future performance. And the present value really is, there's, there's two numbers added together. You'll take the net cash flow for each projected year, you discount them using a rate to present value, and then total those to determine the present value of the cash flows. It's typically over a five to seven year period. And then there's, there's a residual value determined via a capitalization rate of the latest projected cash flow year, usually 20%, and then a present value adjustment utilized to determine the current value. On, on slide 22, we talk a little bit about the market approach. There's a transaction methodology, which is the most commonly used methodology within the market approach. There's also a guideline public company that analyzes you know, comps of public companies and is not typically used in the valuation of physician practices. You know, the fair market value basically is the price paid for comps in the marketplace. You know, you'll compare the practice under consideration to actual transactions in a similar specialty or region. For example, one of the data sets we use is the Goodwill Registry. 
So if you look at the Goodwill Registry for 2012, those reports include actual transactions for over 4,000 medical, dental, and other you know, clinical practices from 2002 to 2011. When you look at um, similar transactions and, and, and relevant transactions, you typically limit that period to the last two years. So you look at the last 24 months. And you look at certain data elements. You know, you might look at goodwill as a percent of net revenue. You might look at, you know, a multiple, a price to revenue multiple. There's, there's lots of different ways you can use that data to then apply it to your, you know, specific situation. For example, you may end up in all your analysis and say, we believe practices in this locality are basically selling at one times revenue, or maybe at six times EBITDA and do your calculations and see where that takes you. Um, so that's basically the market approach. Slide 23, cost approach, again, you know, not typically used for physician practices. I'm not going to spend much time on it at all. Um, you know, it's used in valuations where hard assets are the primary drivers of value. You know, when you look at PPE intensive, heavy buildings, heavy equipment, um, you know, services really aren't the driver, it's the equipment. That's when the cost approach, it becomes much more relevant. And in the, um, on slide 24, when you go through these different methodologies and decide which ones best apply in your situation, you look at a summary of value. There's a correlation of enterprise value, you know, based on the specifics of the transaction. You know, the experts that are doing this valuation have to weigh the different methods and approaches and determine which is the most appropriate one in valuing the specific target practice they're considering. Um, you can determine fair market value on a combination of methods. Um, you know, practices usually lend themselves to a mixed methodology using a combination of three methods. And then, you know, fair market value can even be based on a midpoint of value under one methodology. You know, ranges of value can be listed. Many times I've seen a median value be determined to represent the fair market value. From a transaction methodology of the market approach, sometimes a range of price to revenue multiples is calculated and then applied to a target practice as normalized revenue to determine a range of fair market value. So with all that discussion on the different valuation methods, I'll uh, turn it back over to Martha for polling question number three. Okay, polling question number three is what is the most commonly used valuation method for primary care physician practices? The fair market value approach, the cost approach, the income approach, the market approach, or the IRS standard of value approach. So please select one of the answers um, if you're needing CPE requirements so that we can uh, log your, your mm -hmm. vote. Give you just a couple more minutes or a couple, few more seconds on that so that we can get all of those answered. Okay, the majority. <clears throat> Selected 46% said the fair market value method, 38% said um, the uh, income approach, 8% had the, the cost approach. So Bob, I'll let you explain yeah. um, that answer, and I will remind we've got about 10 minutes left on the webinar. Okay. Um, the correct answer is three, the income approach. And the, the key is, you know, the question asks, what was the valuation method? Um, and method is the key word there. Um, some of them are, are curveballs where there really isn't a fair market value method, um, and that's what I was trying to convey. So sorry if I, I tricked anyone into choosing a different answer. But with with 10 minutes to go, let me um, let me get back on the on the slides, um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna move ahead. I think to the last section. There's a couple of other um, 
slides on the, the, the actual components of evaluation report. I think they kind of speak for themselves. So I'm going to go ahead and skip up to um, you know, reviewing the post-acquisition integration process because it is important and I do want to spend a little bit of time there. Um, so on slide 28, um, you know, what are some of the practical issues and challenges that um, both sides run into when, when going in through this exercise? And first is, you know, day one onboarding. I'd, I'd say for most of us who have been through this, it's fair to say that most practice onboarding efforts have been less than optimally executed. Um, you know, you always look back and say, I probably should have did things a little bit differently. I, I'll live and learn and I'll do it differently next time. Um, you know, things like practic practice hours. You know, hospitals find, you know, they do studies and, and sometimes they look closely at some of the practices that they purchased and they realize that, you know, certain practices that were closed to new patients that are no longer accepting new patients probably should. Um, you know, practices over the years tend to get set in their ways and, and you know, they can be more um, available to new patients and, and you always want new patients coming into certain practices. So there's holes that are noted in schedules that sometimes don't support a closed practice mentality and the practice hours, you know, sometimes are adjusted in that regard. There's, there's, also, there's always billing and coding training. You know, you're going to use new hospital super bills and templates to generate charges. You're unfamiliar with those, so they're going to take some training. There's lots of coding compliance that hospitals do that physician practices are not used to doing. So many times when new practices enter a health system, the corporate compliance function gets involved and the compliance auditors get involved, and they look at accuracy reviews and there's, there's usually, you know, a fair amount of follow-up with physician education and coder education to get up to speed on, you know, hospital policies and practices with regard to, to coding compliance. You know, just arranging for ancillary services is a whole different thing. You know, vendor arrangements that these, you know, physician groups had for providing lab radiology, cardiology services are all replaced with hospital-driven processes. You know, procedures for timing and communication of test results have changed. Some have been enhanced through web-based patient portals. It's a different process. It's, an, it's another area of a learning curve. You know, requisitioning, you know, medical and office supplies seems pretty mundane and easy, but practice administrative staff have to be trained on how they actually requisition these things. Um, physician leadership and culture. Physicians and practice leaders many times lack the experience in the hospital management, you know, structure and culture and process. They're, you know, accustomed to having management control and they feel sometimes a lack of input. They feel this, you know, sometimes, sometimes dis, uh, diminished, disengaged, and, um, you know, you want them to, to be, you know, involved and, and be stakeholders in the success of the practice. And there's quite a bit of non-physician employees that are involved in these in these issues. Um, nurses, you know, allied health professionals, ancillary personnel, they're all going to be transitioned to the hospital. You know, retirement plans, health benefit plans, they all have to be considered for these types of employees as part of this integration. Um, on page 29, you know, realization of the transaction realities themselves. You know, really, what is the true cost of the of the acquisition itself? You might just think it's the purchase price, but there's a variety of hidden costs. You know, way be you know way in extent of the purchase price paid. You know, there can be increased malpractice insurance premiums. There there could be obligations for new leases and office space. There can be expenses related to expanding the electronic medical record um, system and other IT systems and capabilities. Also, you know, don't diminish the um, the effort it takes, you know, the training costs, the downtime for the physicians and the practice staff to gain a working knowledge of hospital policies, procedures, processes. Um, there's going to be a need to add physician extenders. Many transactions are predicated on fulfilling a physician's request for an improved work-life balance. Of course, this is enabled through, you know, more coverage by other clinical extenders. So. You know, typically NPs, PAs, RNs, nutritionists are made available and are dedicated to the practice to provide that, you know, additional coverage. And there's cost to build out the new patient care model, um, you know, 
under the new Affordable Care Act environment, under the reform environment, there's you know a restructuring that's going to take place to provide wellness care. You know, you're going to need health coaches, physician extenders, you know, to closely monitor the patient population that you're going to be responsible for. There's going to be cost to come in, in, in contact with that. And you know, with the risks for the health systems themselves post integration. You know, again, monkey see, monkey do. Have you gone through this with little thought? And now you've got the responsibility to, you know, optimize and integrate a practice into your, um, you know, daily life, and it's it's a lot of work. Let's say you didn't have a, a well thought out strategy. Um, how do I see myself in five years and beyond? Will I be more of a general, non -spec specially specific hospital? And therefore, you know, should I be buying primary care practices? Um, you know, if you see yourself excelling in deep specialties. Which specific one should you pursue? You know, ortho, neuro, cardiology. Which one do your pe competitors already play heavily in? Um, you always want to respond rather than initiate. You know, are, are docs close to retirement banging on your door with little options that they have other than throwing their, the keys to their practice on your desk? You know, are you being forced into some of these deals? Be, you know, defensively because a competitor is you know poaching basically in your backyard. And, and you've got to respond. So there's some of the risks. You know, what are some of the difficulties that are typically run into? Many times there's significant losses generated. Many marginally profitable practices start losing money overnight because they're now applying hospital overhead to a private practice. And every time a, a practice starts losing money, hospitals focus many times is a revert back to productivity. Um, and we all know <laughs> where that goes. Um, you know, how many times have we heard CFOs, hospital CFOs, administrators say, I know we can't turn a profit, but I wish there was a way to simply lose less money. Um, you know, there's a lack of bandwidth. You know, hospital administrators have had to do more with less for years. You know, couple this with the countless initiatives going on with IT conversions, you know, risk-based contracts, moving from volume to value. It's no surprise that there's little time left in their day to focus on you know, the efforts required to properly integrate a physician practice. Um, you know, use of an over, uh, use of an only uh, productivity only model, you know, is typically tied to volume of production and it goes, flies in the face of the shift in the delivery system from volume to value. And, you know, it's an old way of operating, but it's just a knee jerk reaction in, uh, you know, in a lot of these situations. So, with that, let me move to slides 33, 32 and 33, or no, wait, oh, I'm sorry, 32, um, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll close this down. I know I only have a couple of minutes left. Um, gaining meaningful physician citizenship, you know, trying to create value, you want the hospital and the physician organization to really align and perform as an integrated unit. Um, you want physicians engaged in clinical boards or committees to be, you know, shoulder to shoulder with the hospital in things like patient safety and quality. Um, you want to pay attention to patient and nursing satisfaction scores. And there's a team approach, obviously, to transforming medicine. You know, the focus on integrating physicians at all levels, you know, is really required in terms of leadership, recruitment, and development. And lastly, just um, to turn it upside down, just what are the top 10 ways I've seen how to make a good practice look bad? Um, there's 10 things here. I don't have time to go through all 10. Um, just the first one, um, you know, remove credit for office ancillaries. You know, hospital executives are great at taking well-functioning, profitable practices, stripping out the ancillaries and wondering why they're now losing money. You know, as attractive as a provider-based reimbursement is, it's kind of inefficient for the patient, and you take away the patient-physician focus when you do that. So, consider that. Um, you know, moving the pro practice under hospital CBO is is another. Um, you know, managing physician revenue cycles. You know, an art unto itself, and and it, it's difficult for a hospital already taxed CBO to deal with that. 
and you know the, the influx of the high deductible plans really, really impacts the cash collections efforts that take place. Um, you can read the others that are here. Um, and on the last page, on page 34, um, you know, focusing on referrals and contribution margin, number six. You know, when you boil it all down, physicians are most interested in what got them into medicine in the first place. So, you know, they want to provide, you know, exceptional patient care. Um, you know, few of them ever intended on becoming billing experts and coding or responding to insurance company denials. So, you know, that's that's work they have to do, but not work they want to do. So, just just bear that in mind. I know I went right to the end. I'm sorry. I tried to finish a little bit early, but um, Martha, that's that's what I had. Okay, thank you, Bob. And we didn't have any questions entered in our chat, but if you do have questions and uh, as you're reviewing back through this information, then Bob's contact information is on the last slide. Uh, we appreciate your time today and thank you for attending. Um, I hope everyone has a very Merry Christmas and um, a Happy New Year. And with that, we're closed. So thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Bob.